Hi, welcome to CCM Connect. This week we're talking about faith on the spectrum. And uh, we're all sitting around here again within six feet of each other. So we've got our nice lovely masks on. And uh, Miranda just has a beautiful cat paw mask that she won with her stickers. So got to make sure that our cameraman gets in on that. I don't know why I'm talking about that. <laughs> we're not talking about Miranda's mask this week. We're going to be talking to one of our students, Maggie, um, now that I've just got you all laughing. Um, Maggie, um, this was your idea to talk about faith on the spectrum, and by that I mean how uh, those who have autism or, or any kind of related, um, uh, related issues interact with the faith and how it might inter- affect them in their practice of the faith. So before we get into that, though, um, introduce yourself to us for those watching who, who don't know you. I mean, uh, and specifically, has the faith always been important to you in your life? I know when you came here as a freshman, you know, you already were very committed to the faith, and, and it seemed to me anyway that you had a very active prayer life, and it was important. Was it always been that way to you, or is that a recent thing? Um, that was actually a more recent thing. Um, I grew up Catholic with my parents, but they weren't very active. And then in high school, I had a really low point in my life, and that was kind of a reconversion for me. And that's what really spurred me into being a devout Catholic. Great, great. So it's kind of that, that experience of feeling in, in need, kind of responding from that spiritual poverty that made you, you know, practice the faith a little bit more intentionality, I guess. Okay, great. Um, and the reason, though, why this was the idea that you wanted to share with us tonight, and we're, we're talking to you, is because you you have a condition. Do you want mm-hmm. to tell us about, about that and what that is? Yeah, so um, I have Asperger's syndrome, and um, Asperger's syndrome is more commonly referred to now as high-functioning autism. And so autism is um, a disorder that affects, uh, it's basically a rewiring of the brain. It affects the nervous system. And so people with autism have difficulty with social interactions, with um, with like coordination and um, they tend to have like really focused interests in in very particular things. Um, those are the three main kind of staples of autism. And uh, like in the um, in the title, you know, faith in the spectrum, it is a spectrum. So um, you know, there's people that are high functioning, like um, like myself. Uh, you know, in more popular culture, like Sheldon Cooper, who um, He's a guy from the Big Bang Theory, Uh right? Yes, yes. (laughs) And he, you know, they can function in society. You know, I can dress myself, I can bathe myself, I can feed myself, you know, I I go to school, things Mm -hmm. like that. Whereas um, low-functioning people, you know, they may not they may not be able to talk they may not be able to take care of themselves and so they have to have somebody that can take care of that can take care of them because they're not able to do those things for themselves right okay Mm -hmm. so yeah one of the things i was going to ask is like what's the relationship between asperger's and autism Mm -hmm. are they the same thing are they different things but i I think you've answered that like it has to do with where it lies on the spectrum or um so in the dsm-4 uh, which was, we're in the DSM-5 now. So in the DSM-4, Asperger's was separate, was a separate condition from autism. Um, but it had some, like, very similar landmarks to autism. The main, and there's still some kind of controversy over what the difference is. And the main difference that people point out is that people with autism, they don't try to be socially interactive. Whereas people with Asperger's, you know, we want to try and interact. We just aren't very good at it. Um, And so uh, that was kind of the difference, but then they kind of lumped everything together in the DSM-5. I was diagnosed when the DSM-4 was around. The DSM-5 came out in 2012. Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah. What's DSM? The, um, oh gosh, it's the Psychological Conditions Manual. I forgot what it stands for, though. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But it's it's the book. It's the book. It's the book. Like, Psychological Conditions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they used to consider it a separate thing, but now they're thinking, mm-hmm. oh, it might be a little bit more related. And yeah, yeah. Okay. And there were other conditions as well, like uh, Rett syndrome and other kind of autistic disorders that they kind of lumped in. So now um, it's not I have Asperger's syndrome. It's I have autism, um, or it's like I have Asperger's relating to autism, or fancy wording. Okay. <laughs> but they're because related. It's just, yeah, they're very They're related, related yes. from what we think. Okay. And, and the key characteristics are, you said trouble with social interactions mm-hmm. and coordination, mm-hmm. you said is a difficulty. And then the third one that you mentioned was? 
uh, intense special interests. A very intense special interest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So part of that, having a hard time with social interaction, picking up social cues, like having to wear masks all the time, like is that messing with you yes. a lot more? <laughs> it yeah. is. It is. Um, you know, I it, for someone with uh, with Asperger's and with autism in general, eye contact is a very difficult thing sometimes uh -huh. for some people. I know when I was younger, I had a difficult time with eye contact, and I basically had to train myself to look at pe look people in the eye for an extended period of time. And you can probably notice right now when I'm thinking, I look away to gather my thoughts. And then when I'm speaking, I'll look directly at you. And um, so when I can only see somebody's eyes and it's uncomfortable for me to look at somebody's eyes for an extended period of time, that can be quite, um, quite difficult. And I, you know, a lot of people with autism have this problem. So I, and a lot of autistic people out there are misreading cues and, you know, being uncomfortable because all we can see are people's eyes. Right. Yeah. And if you're having a hard time picking up on those social cues to begin with, mm -hmm. having so many of them masked, literally masked, mm -hmm. right, uh, must be even even harder. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. so Give her your mic. So with that, are you like you more prone to have like anxiety or like other things like that? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, very much so. Um, so there are actually a lot of comorbidities with autism and anxiety and depression being uh, two of them. And I have both. Um, so, uh, yes, I do get a lot of anxiety. Uh, if like if I'm around you guys, you guys are all my friends um, and I know you guys well, so I'm not as you know, anxious, but if I'm in a new place and like a stranger is talking to me or I have to ask for help in a grocery store or something, I'm very nervous. So how, how are you diagnosed? Like at what mm -hmm. point did you realize that, you know, you don't interact the same way that other people do, mm -hmm. that there might be something, was that something you were always aware of or? So, um, I was not actually always aware of my condition. Um, my parents noticed that I had, um, that I was different when I was very young. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, a motor and a verbal tick when I was, uh, you know, one to two years old. I would um, kind of grunt and bob my head. And um, at the time for the DSM-4, at least from what the research made it sound like, that was all that was needed to diagnose somebody with Tourette's syndrome. Oh. And so originally I was diagnosed with Tourette's. Um, my mom thinks that it's actually like a co-diagnosis. I think it was a misdiagnosis, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, then at around, the, and there were some other flat red flags too. Um, I started talking at nine months of age. Wow. And instead of, you know, like mama, dada, hi, things like that, I had a sentence. I said, what's that? I started saying, what's that at nine, at nine months old? Mm. And so part of at the Aspergian diagnosis is an, ex an extensive vocabulary. Um, and so interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I started saying, what's that at nine years old or nine years, nine months old. And, um, I never learned how to crawl. I went from rolling around to eventually walking and I started walking late, which goes into the motor, the motor skills, uh, side of autism. Right. 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 And then, um, I around, oh, I'd say two years old. I think I might be getting my dates a little bit wrong, but I was very young. I just suddenly stopped talking. I didn't talk, and that's a big red flag for uh, with young for young children that hey, this might be autism. Um, so I stopped talking for a while, and then all of a sudden just started talking again. And it was to the point that my parents thought I was going to be severely autistic. Uh, but then I, I started talking again. Um, thank God. But yeah, and then um, my mom was like, you know, this isn't Tourette's. This this isn't Tourette's, this isn't fit Tourette's. And so she brought me back in to get, uh, to get reevaluated and I got diagnosed at six. Uh -huh. Um, and then I didn't know that I had the condition until I was 10 years old. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I'd always gotten picked on in, at school. I was bullied, uh, all through elementary school. And, um, one time I was in the car and my mom was talking on the phone as she was driving and my younger, my youngest brother, Sam was getting, uh, was going through the same tests as I was. And the doctor had called her and said, hey, you know, your son has Asperger's and ADHD. And they offered her, they, offered her, they, were, they said, oh, um, you know, do you, do you need any help with that? Do you need any, you know, literature or any help or anything? And she said, oh, no, my daughter has Asperger's. I'll be fine. And I was like, 
hey mom what's that <laughs> so you just yeah. overheard that uh -huh. and so like, you weren't yeah. aware before then i was that, not aware wow. at all and i was like hey, hey mom what, what's that and she kind of explained to me and, I, and then i was like everything makes sense now that's why i'm so weird so, <laughs> <laughs> so how did that i mean was did it come as a relief to you to kind of have a name to put on how you were feeling it did it was somewhat of a relief um because then i could go into class i actually did this at the end of fifth grade because i was picked on so much and i was like this is why i'm weird and basically just kind of explained everything as you know like i have asperger syndrome you know this is what someone with Asperger's syndrome struggles with this is what we deal with every day you know please be nice to me this is why I'm so weird just you know wow. don't pick on me anymore kind of thing so instead of like yeah, feeling so feeling different feeling separated because you, you you did like a show and tell yeah you, you went and told your class like hey this is me mm -hmm. and how did did they accept you for yeah, that yeah they were they were very receptive about it and um yeah and even now I try to raise awareness mm -hmm. you know um I think awareness is is key to acceptance, um, you know, and accommodation for people with autism. Yeah. Which is why you wanted to talk about mm -hmm. it tonight, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, good for yeah. you. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. That's really good. So, yeah, I think we've um, established what, what autism is and, uh, and Asperger's and how, you know, it's affected you a little bit about your story. So let's get to the heart of mm -hmm. it, the reason why we're doing this video tonight. How does all of that impact the way that you practice the Catholic faith? That's what you wanted to, to, to share. So yeah, tell us yeah. about that. So um, one of the things that I really like about the Catholic faith from an Asperger's perspective is one of the things that, Asper uh, that Aspergians and autistic people have to have is routine. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the Catholic church is really good at that because yeah. it's, it's all, it's ritual. And so, um, you know, I could go to California on vacation or something and, you know, Sunday rolls around and I have to go to mass and I would know what to do. I would blend in, you know, um, all the readings are the same. The mass parts are the same. They might be worded slightly different, but they're all the same. Um, whereas, you know, if I go to, um, a Methodist church down in one, on one street, they could be talking about something completely different about the method than the Methodist church on a different street. And, um, and we love our Methodist. Yeah. Friends. Yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> like, you know, um, it's just having that routine really grounds me mm -hmm. and helps me able to better participate in the faith mm -hmm. because, um, then I also don't feel like I stand out. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like, you know, Oh, am I doing something wrong or do I look you know, do I look out of place, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, with it being so, you know, quiet and kind of reserved, then everyone kind of sticks to themselves, you know, and I'm not, the spotlight isn't on, isn't on me, you know, I'm not worried about, um, you know, am I like, <laughs> I can't even think of something, uh, like, is my shirt crinkled funny or, you know, am I speaking weird? Am I, you know, do, do I look like I, um, am angry when I'm not things just yeah. little things that I worry about with having both Asperger's and anxiety. The um. ritual kind of <laughs> takes you out of yourself mm -hmm. for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Like I was expecting to come out initially and say, Oh, these are the challenges that, mm -hmm. that, you know, my condition, um, you know, puts with me practicing the faith rather than saying, well, this is a benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's beautiful because I think all of us, kind of can feel that way to a certain extent that we're, we can find comfort in ritual mm -hmm. um, because it is the same. And, and I know like the past several months with everything going on with the coronavirus and so much is kind of in flux and chaotic, mm -hmm. one of the things that's been a real source of comfort for me has been precisely the ritual, mm -hmm. the rituals that we have as, as Catholics. And um, it just, as you were talking, it came to mind a, a quote from Hilaire Belloc. There's a passage in his book, The Path to Rome. He's like an early 20th century Catholic English writer, but he talks about how much he enjoys going to daily mass because there's just something good about starting your day every day by losing yourself in a ritual that you don't mm -hmm. have to think about. It just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. So I can see yeah. how that would be really helpful to someone mm -hmm. who needs that routine yeah so. yeah and it's also sensory friendly another thing uh -huh. that people with autism struggle with is sensory processing that's usually a, i call it a comorbidity but i can't really think of a better word for it um and so uh 
like a neurotypical person's uh, brain can filter out most stimuli and mm -hmm. just, you know, focus on the stuff that it needs. Whereas an autistic person can't filter it. So we just process everything. Mm -hmm. So a good example that I've heard is that, um, you know, when you put your shirt on in the morning after, you know, a minute, five minutes, you probably don't feel it on your skin anymore. Right. Whereas when I put my shirt on in the morning, I feel it all day. I can feel it all the time on my skin. And so, um, you know, it's sensory friendly because, um, you know, it's, it's quiet music, you know, the hymns are kind of calming. It's not loud. Um, the incense for me, I know, I know that some people might find it, um, overwhelming, but for it, the incense is kind of calming. It's a nice scent. Um, the lights aren't bright or changing or anything. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's calming. And it's, you know, I don't feel overwhelmed. So you you wouldn't prefer like, you know, the typical, say, like Life Teen Mass where they've got like no, guitar music. And no, drums I lot. love Latin Mass because it's quiet. <laughs> you like the quiet, more yes. contemplative. That's that's an interesting consideration to, mm -hmm. to think like just for, you know, for parish music directors, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you know that you have families, you know, with autistic people in your parish. That That's good to know that that would be a consideration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, and then I'm going to get a little bit into what I've struggled with. Okay. Um, so for a while, um, I kind of struggled with the thought of if I wasn't autistic, would I be a better Christian? Would I have a better relationship with God? And I really struggled with that because, you know, I know that some that I have some deficits with interacting with others, mm -hmm. but it's not like if I read about it, I'll just suddenly figure it out and be able to do it. You know, it just doesn't click. Mm -hmm. um, the best way that I've heard it described is like that uh, when neurotypical people learn how to socialize, it's like a sponge. Mm -hmm. They just soak it all up. Whereas an autistic person, you know, their sponge doesn't quite work as well. And so I know I have deficits and I can't really fix them. And so, you know, I was like, you know, how does this impact my relationship with God? And, um, you know, I talked to you about it and, you put it beautifully, um, you know, you said God made us, you know, he knew us before our moms even knew we were in the, in the womb, you know, and um, he's also perfect. He's God. And so he has a perfect relationship with everybody. And so if anyone knows me and the struggles that I'm going through, it's going to be God. That's true. Yeah. And so that was really comforting. And then um, what I'm still kind of struggling with is, you know, okay, well, how does this affect me being, you know, uh, part of the body of Christ relating to other people in the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just something I think I've got to work out, you know, with myself and with God. But, um, yeah, like I know that <laughs> I know I have deficits, but I don't know how to fix them. And so, <laughs> um, and I, don't, so <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's just like, well, I, you know, I want to be a better, I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better, um, a better person. I want to be able to relate better to people, but I just quite can't get it to where I want it to be. So. Is that something like, have you talked about that with other, you know, members of the autistic community? Like, is that something that's common? Yeah. That, that yeah. I have with? a good friend who has Asperger's as well. And we're both, you know, we, <laughs> it's kind of like a joking thing between us. It's like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the struggles that we go through, but like a, like, like in a lighthearted manner. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it can get pretty real sometimes too, where it's like, you know, like she had a crush on somebody and was like, you know, oh, I really want to, you know, tell them that I like them and, you know, and just, um, just trying to navigate relation like dating relationships and things like that. We were both kind of stumbling together. Like, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm autistic too. What do you want me to say? But, um, yeah. And just, you know, we both realized, you know, in both of our, you know, friendship relationships, romantic relationships, what have you, you know, we're both like, <laughs> this kind of sucks sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you just have to admit that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and say that. That's, that's a really good point because I know one of the things that people with autism will struggle with is that forming relationships, you know, mm -hmm. because that's, that's hard when you don't pick up on the social cues. And so much of our, of our faith we speak of in terms of relationship. It's mm -hmm. about our relationship with God, our relationship with, with each other as members of the body of Christ. And so when you kind of feel like you've got that block mm -hmm. in, in terms of like a stumbling block in forming a relationship with other people, that that would also impact 
you know, your, your faith. So have you found anything that's helped you with that? Um, I just be very upfront with people, mm -hmm. um, especially with people that I first meet. You know, if I know I'm going to be good friends with them, I'll be like, just kind of come up front and be like, hey, I have Asperger's syndrome. If I'm being weird, you can let me know. <laughs> 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 Sorry. You can be, you can let me know, you know, just, you know, if I say something weird or if I'm not getting a joke, um, Asperger people usually tend to take things very literally. Uh -huh. um, so it's like, if this is a joke and I don't get it, you just tell me, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, just let me know. Cause I don't want to stand there and look awkward and weird. You know, if I'm being weird, just let me know yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. That's, that's great yeah. actually, because you know, I think so when, I when keep, someone can, um, kicking somebody's foot. Yeah, that's my foot. Sorry. I've got, I've got <laughs> giant, I've got giant feet. So they take up all the space underneath the table. Um, you know, when someone can be really upfront with someone, especially that you're, you know, you're friends with, or you have to spend time with like a coworker or a classmate, and just say, hey, this is me. This is what, like you did with your class. You know, mm -hmm. this is me. This is what I got going on. This is this is what I'm working with. You know, here, um, it puts us then in a better position to be to be charitable to you because now we know a little bit more about you and mm -hmm. what you've got going on. So if someone tells me, oh, I might be, if you see me acting this way, it's because X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Then when I do see you acting that way, I'm like, oh, okay. It's that's, that's normal for Maggie. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, she's dealing with this. And then it informs me then to be able to respond more positively, mm -hmm. you know, to you. So I just think whether we're talking about something like Asperger's or anything that any of us have going on, I just think it helps other people to be more charitable towards us if we can just admit and say, this is what I got going on. You know, this is, so that's beautiful. I love yeah. that. I love that a lot. Um, yeah, anything else that you wanted to share about how, how this has impacted yeah. your faith? Um, sometimes during mass, it can be a little, um, well, not, I'm not going to say just during mass, but, um, it can be sometimes a little sensory unfriendly. So like that one it's and like that I'm keep bringing up this and I know that you, <laughs> I know that you didn't mean to do this, but uh -huh. uh, that one time during adoration when you forgot to switch the incense to a more indoor incense. Oh, and we were still using yeah, that kind. And the, 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 the outdoor the incense yeah. and it was just like super smoky and I'm sitting there like, wow, this is a lot of scent. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's things, if there's like a lot of incense or like if it's like a life teen mass yeah. or um, maybe like a charismatic mass where it's upbeat and a lot of music and loud, then that would affect me. And um, so then what do you do yeah. if you're in that situation where it's just becoming too much? Yeah, if, I, it's, if it's becoming too much, um, sometimes I don't really notice it until I get really snappy, which is not good. And I need to get better at doing that. But I'll notice when I start getting, um, you know, super anxious and um, that means I'm kind of close to a, I call it an autistic meltdown. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's to my, the best way I can describe it is like having a seizure, but being completely aware. Okay. So like, I, ha like I feel compelled to, you know, it's called stimming. Um, it kind of helps me uh, process stimulation. And so um, basically my body has to stim or it just makes it worse. No, is that like like shake your hands or something? Yeah, like or... I'll rock and I'll, I'll be sobbing, <laughs> you know, I'll uh -huh. sob, I'll cry and, you know, I'll rock. And then I have some maladaptive ones where I'll pick up my skin and, you know, things like that. So if I notice that I'm getting kind of close to that, I'll bring myself away to like a quiet area and um, I'll put on a hoodie because that kind of grounds me and, um, it's almost like a hug, but not, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. and, um, you know, just kind of try to calm down. Like, um, I was close to one the other day and you saw me on the couch. I was in my hoodie, just in a cocoon, in a blanket, With a blanket wrapped around. Yeah. You. yeah it looked like you were in a cocoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And so, you know, just a quiet area. And then I kind of distract myself. I'll turn on, you know, if I'm able to get away to like my room or something, mm -hmm. I'll turn on the TV and put on something funny. Um, uh, when I was, what I did counseling for my anxiety and part of my anxiety to help with my meltdowns was I would ground myself by using um, a lotion, my favorite scent to be like, okay, I'm putting on lotion. Uh -huh. I can feel my, the hands on, um, you know, I can feel my hands rubbing together. I can feel the lotion on my skin. I can smell, I, my favorite scent is sweet pea. I can smell the sweet pea, um, things like that to ground myself and bring me out of this you know, anxiety. So something known, something that is familiar mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, you know, if I, if I'm out in public and I notice that those things are going on, I'll kind of just, you know, I'll probably just leave cause that's the best thing for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave and then it takes me a little bit to decompress. So, you know, I'll go and just chill out and not worry about homework or anything, just decompress.
So you've had to learn recuperate. a lot of self care. Mm -hmm. You really yes, have. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Do yeah. Uh, do any of you guys have questions for Maggie around that? You do, Miranda. Here, I'll pass the microphone. Uh, so one question is, I know that we've been doing outdoor masses. Mm -hmm. Has that been, um, I can't remember the term you used, uh, sensory friendly? Sensory friendly. Um, at first it wasn't because of the cars passing by. I couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. And it was also distracting. You just hear, you know, uh, throughout mass. And also when, when some of the people would kind of heckle a little bit, that always would scare me because, you know, I'm just chilling out and all of a sudden this loud noise and um, I'd get startled. But um, now that we're doing it kind of inside outside, it's nice. Um, and also I feel grounded kind of in nature, like mm -hmm. it's a calming thing for me. Um, when I would go visit my grandparents' house and when we lived near there, if I was having a hard time, I'd just go out and wander in the woods. Um, and so having outdoor mass was nice. If it, it would be nice uh, if there weren't a bunch of, if there wasn't a bunch of traffic. Yeah, traffic and <laughs> yeah. rude people. Yeah, and rude people, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I love outdoor mass. It's just, you know, if there's a bunch of cars and traffic, I can't fully participate in mass because I can't hear anything, and I'm more focused on trying not to get overstimulated than on mass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was my question. Did anybody else have a question for Maggie? So what kind of advice would you give someone who's on the spectrum or even struggling with anxiety or something like that? Yeah. Uh, I think the first thing would be to talk to somebody uh, and, you know, be open about having Asperger's because, you know, even though there is still some stigma, I think a lot of people are like, oh, okay, well, let me try and help you out here. Like what, what Deacon was saying. Um, just be open and upfront about it and, um, you know, maybe talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist because they can give you, you know, like, um, give you really good advice. Like my psychologist helped me a lot with self-care. Um, um, with for, for things during mass to do, um, or especially during adoration, since it's so quiet and kind of still, what I try to do is bring something that I can fidget with. So like I'll usually say a rosary during adoration because I can touch the beads and it's repetitive. Um, sometimes I bring a fidget cube if I just want to, you know, be there in the, in, just be there in silence. I would bring a fidget cube. Um, I also have a mouth stem. And so sometimes I bring something I can chew on. I have like a chewable necklace. Um, so if anyone, you know, is struggling with, you know, they, if they have stems that they, want to do or if they get in a place where it's really silent and they are fidgety maybe bring something to fidget with yeah. um as well yeah i feel like the catholic church is ahead of the game you know because like I, I know these fidget toys are really common right now not mm -hmm. just for people with autism but you know kids with adhd and all of mm -hmm. that and i'm like well, we, we've got the rosary that's like yeah yeah that's the like the original, original fidget toy. yeah the original <laughs> but it's a prayerful you yeah, know it fidget is. fidget Definitely, toy so yeah, yeah that's yeah. uh so when we see you with your rosary beads in adoration, you're like that's that's part, cool. yeah, yeah. Part of it is you know, me stimming and you're praying. Yeah, and praying. Yeah, <laughs> kill two birds with one stone. That's right. <laughs> so, um, any other questions yeah, for Maggie? Question. You do, Jesse. Yeah. So I know, like, I think it was our first meeting. We talked about the four temperaments, mm -hmm. and so like some of the things that I noticed you were talking about, like um, having to sort of shelter away from people or being overloaded by like too much social interaction mm -hmm. do you feel like some of the the attributes of asperger's kind of also put you into certain aspects of the temperament yeah definitely um definitely yeah with uh with the melancholic temperament you know as jesse said uh we're very introverted and a lot of autistics are introverts because of the way that we can't really socially inter socially interact as well as well, and the stimulus, as regular, and the stimulus yeah. as well, yes. So I think definitely if if someone has autism or Asperger's that they fall a lot into the melancholic temperament because of um, you know the sensory issues and uh, social deficits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you don't know what Jesse's talking about with the temperaments, go back and watch our first CCM Connect video this semester <laughs> because we talked about the the four temperaments and melancholic is one of the mm -hmm. one of the four temperaments. So, and you are you are that, that's your temperament, right? Yes, yeah. that's my. I'm almost 100% melancholic. Wow. With a little bit of sanguine in there, yeah. but yeah, it's wow. mostly melancholic. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. cool. Yeah. So when you were taking the temperaments test, you were probably like nodding your head. Yeah, yeah, I was yep, like, oh yeah, yep, that's, that's me. That's there me. we go. <laughs> So um, I guess before we wrap up here, Maggie, I just want to know, is there any 
parting advice, parting words of wisdom that you can share that will make people with autism feel more at home in the body of Christ? Either advice mm-hmm. for people with autism or advice for, as you described them, you know, neurotypical yeah. people. How, how can we make people who are struggling with this feel more at home in the body of Christ? Yeah, um, so for, I think I explained um, pretty good with uh, for people with autism. Um, I can add more if I need to um, later on. But for, uh, for neurotypical people, I think uh, just be patient, definitely, and um, just kind of, I would say be open-minded. Um, you know, there might be a low-functioning autistic person in the congregation that might be making noise or something, and instead of, you know, getting mad or, you know, telling off the caregiver or the parent, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like with a crying baby where it's like, yes, we know that this baby is crying but we can't really do much about it. And, um, you they're know, praising they, God the way yeah, they know how. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. And that autistic person may be making noise to calm themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just kind of, you know, be like, okay, just kind of accept that it's happening and move on. Um, you know, if you see, sometimes like, sometimes when I'm sitting still, I'll rock. You've probably seen me in mass, I sway. And, you know, if you see somebody doing that, um, just be like, oh, okay, that's, that's what they're doing <laughs> kind of thing. Just be patient and accepting. Um, if you see someone with maybe like a fidget toy or like toys or something, don't be quick to judge because maybe they're on the spectrum and they need that to focus. Um, I think those are the top three that I can, that I can think of. So be patient. Yeah. Be, be patient, patient and be loving. Yes. Be patient and be loving. Yes. That's, <laughs> be Catholic in other words. Yeah. That's how Catholics should be. Um, you know, and it's it's funny because if we're more patient and we're more loving, then we're more like God because mm-hmm. those are attributes of God. So just to go back to what you were saying earlier about sometimes feeling like you're having a hard time relating to God, mm-hmm. if if people being patient and loving make them relate to you better and God is perfectly patient and perfectly mm-hmm. loving, that means he can relate to you perfectly. So it just goes back to what you said that God knows how to relate to us mm-hmm. even if we have a hard time relating to him sometimes he mm-hmm. knows perfectly how to relate to us and that's that's beautiful that's mm-hmm. something we should all keep in mind so awesome thank you so much yeah. for sharing i feel like we've all come to know you a little bit better mm-hmm. and um and hopefully this will help us all be more patient and more loving with not just people with autism or asperger's um you know in the body of christ or out in the world but just with everybody um that we that we encounter so let's conclude in a prayer shall we In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, you made us all as uh, as people in your image, and each one of us reflects your image in a different way. Uh, Your image is reflected in our lives through all of our strengths, as well as all of our weaknesses, all of our abilities, and all of our limitations. All of these things glorify you, Lord, and showcase your presence to the world. We ask that you continue to bless us and shower us with all of your grace and help us to learn to relate more, uh, more openly, more lovingly, and more charitably with all of our fellow members of the body of Christ so that together we can rise to heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, guys. Thanks be to God.